Good morning, church. Happy Lord's Day. Hey, God is good. And all the time, God is good. All right. So this morning, <clears throat> in relation to our scripture reading, we will be talking about the prodigal son. I know you're, you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son, but this morning, we are going to learn some of the life lesson from the prodigal son or the younger son. And we will, uh, this will be a two-part or three-part uh, series. We will talk about the story or the lessons from the younger son, the father, and the older son. All right, so to start off, <clears throat> our lesson this morning about the prodigal son, we'll be talking about greed. A greed. In Luke chapter 15, verse 12, the younger son <clears throat> said to him, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. According to Webster, greed is an eager desire of longing. A desire especially for wealth, <clears throat> power or provisions. Greed comes from the old English term gridik, or in our term, gracious, which means always hungry for more. Okay, so the younger son <clears throat> was driven by his greed. So he, he already asked the father his share of the estate, even though his father was still alive. Right. He saw that uh, they were wealthy, so he asked for his share. Now, greed, it is a disease. A disease that is so hard to get away from once you are infected by it. And once you get your life or yourself entangled in it, it is really hard to get away from. It is a spiritual disease. All right. It's a spiritual disease of <clears throat> man's heart because it replaces God okay, from what is at the seat of our heart. And that is why greed is also idolatry in the Bible. Again, because we replace God in our hearts and we put something. We take God away and we put something in our hearts. So that is why greed is also called idolatry in the Bible, and it is something that is detestable to God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. Okay? For a greedy person is what? Is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. So when we replace God, when we take God away from, from our heart and replace him with something else that is greed, that is idolatry. So this son, because of his greed, driven by his greed, asked his father to give him a share so that he could squander everything, so that he could live a good life according to him. Greed. Next lesson would be freedom is slavery. In verse 13, after a few days, the younger son got everything together and journeyed to a distant country where he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, let me point out that there is a good kind of freedom and there is a bad kind of freedom. A good kind of freedom is freedom from the slavery of sin. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So this is a good kind of freedom. Freedom from the slavery of sin. Now, what is a bad kind of freedom? A bad kind of freedom is one that which enslaves us. Okay. Now, a classic example are vices. Those are a, a, a classic example of bad kind of freedom. Now, why would I say that? Why did I say that vices are a bad kind of freedom? 
Well, later on, I will expound on that. Now, a, another good kind of freedom that enslaves us, but not to, to sin or works of sin, but it enslaves us to righteousness or it enslaves us of righteousness. And that is a good kind of freedom in Romans chapter 6, verse 18. And having set free from sin, we have now become slave of righteousness. So there is a good kind of freedom. Now, to the younger son, he wanted to live an independent life. That's why he went out from the father's house. He went to a distant country. He took his share of the estate and squandered everything. He wanted what? Freedom. Independent from the father. Now, I want, over, I want all of us to, to listen very carefully, especially the, the, the younger generations that are here with us this morning and those that are listening to us, the younger ones. Okay? Uh, those who, who clamor for freedom or they actually use the more appealing word, independency. I want to be independent, but they're actually asking for freedom. Okay? Now they will tell their parents, they want to establish their independence and they want to establish their own self-sufficiency. So that's why they're asking their parents to, to have their freedom. They wanted to have their own uh, space and their own privacy to set what suits them, to set their preferences, all right? Now, for some, this is actually true, that they wanted really to stand on their own and to really have their uh, their independency, but that is true for some. But for others, that's not really entirely true. Okay? It is just a, a subtle way of telling their parents they want to be out of the house. They want, it's a subtle way of telling their parents, back off. Give me my life. Okay? I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want anybody asking me what time I will be back home. I don't want anybody asking me, where did I come from? Okay. Or why did, I just, I, why did I just arrive right now? Okay. So it's a subtle way of telling their parents really to, you know, give me space, back off, please. Now, they are, they are just using the word independence. Okay. Again, for some, being independent is really true. But for some, there's the other side of being independent that they wanted to uh, to be out and to be at their, be on their own now to be independent just like this younger son okay, he wanted to do what he wanted to do okay, without interference from his father you know the truth of the matter is my dear brethren and friends it is because of this so-called freedom that people are slaves of vices. So that's why I said a while ago, the bad kind of freedom, a classic example of it is vices. Because it is for freedom, and it is because of freedom that people are slaves of these vices. They wanted to be out of their vices. They are shouting, I want to quit smoking. I want to quit my addiction to this and that. I want to quit uh, drinking habit. I want to be sober. You ask the question now, what led them to their vices, to their being a slave to their vices in the first place? Freedom. They don't want to listen. That's why they fell victim to their own desire for freedom. And that is a bad kind of freedom. You know, they don't want anybody telling them what to do. And now they are in the slavery, in slave of that vices. You know now, they want anybody to tell them what to do and help them how to get out of their misery. Quite ironic, isn't it? In the first place, they don't want nobody, anybody, telling them what to do. 
But now, because of their misery, they want anybody to tell them what to do and help them to be out of their misery. So that's a bad kind of freedom. And that is what this kind of freedom that this younger son wanted from the very beginning from his father. That's why he took everything and went to a distant place. Now, and look at what happened to him. After he had spent all he had, a severe famine swept through the country and he began to be in need. He began to be in need. See, the next lesson would be independence from God leads to failure. Our slavery, the, the freedom that we wanted, it leads us to slavery. And then number three, is that our freedom, this independence, would actually lead us to failure. If you want to be away from God, it will lead you to failure. Now, being independent, just to clear, being independent is not, an out, it's not outright wrong. No, it's not. Okay? Now, when, when we were babies, when we were still young, we were totally dependent. We were totally dependent to, to our uh, parents for everything. Then came the time that uh, when we are a bit older, when we gain our freedom, when we gain our uh, independence, we take care of ourselves, we go to our bed, we go and eat our lunch, breakfast, dinner, at the time we want. Okay. So when we grow a bit older, we have that kind of uh, freedom from them. So being independent per se, it is not wrong because you and I have that kind of being, uh, that kind of independence when we were uh, growing up. Okay. But again, as I mentioned, there is this wrong kind of freedom. Now, being uh, independent or being dependent, I would say, we are less influenced by our parents as we, as we grow up. Now, these are not entirely wrong. And sometimes the reason why we want our independence with our parents is the same exact reason why we want to be independent from God. Remember that the, the story about the prodigal son, the story is about a parable. It is a parable. Now, parables, though they are fictional, it holds a real life message. Now, what is happening in the story, in the parable, reflects the realities in this life and the realities in the afterlife. It teaches us to concentrate. It teaches us our, our mind set on having a relationship with God. And that is what uh, the parable means. And that is what the, the parable seeks to, to teach us, to have that understanding and to have that uh, relationship with God because indeed in, there is the afterlife. Now, the younger son foolishly seeks independence from his father that thinking that he could have a happy and meaningful life. Okay. That's, what, uh, that's what probably uh, in his mind, that's why he wanted to be independent from his father, only to find out at the end that his life would be miserable. Now, when we talk of sin, being our lives in, in, in total misery because of our independence away from God, because of our sin, when we talk of sin, we go back to Genesis. We go back to, to Adam and Eve. Okay? And um, learning from Adam and Eve about the sin. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The words, you will be like God. Let me ask you, how do you like the sound of that? You will be like God. Sister Monica, you will be like God. Sounds tempting, isn't it? <laughs> right? So, 
when he heard those words, well, I, would, I was thinking, his eyes probably lit up, you know, and wide open in amazement. It was like, wow, I will be like God, right? So uh, he was probably uh, amazed and thinking to herself, I want to be that. I like that. See, who wouldn't be? So, tem so, so tempting, isn't it? Now, uh, if I would be like God, probably uh, it came to Eve's thought that uh, if I would be like God, then I can have everything. I can be, uh, I can have it my own. And I would be free from his influence. See? And that is freedom. That is being totally independent from God. So when Satan tricked Adam and Eve to touch and eat the forbidden fruit, it was actually, he was trying to get into their minds to have freedom, to have their freedom, to have their independence from God. They wanted Adam and Eve to have nothing to do with anything at all with God. So he was trying to convince them, you can have, you could have your freedom, you could be like God and do anything that you want to do away from his influence. And that is freedom. Okay. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, okay, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but uh, is of the world. Now, what happened to Adam and Eve with their lust of the flesh, with their lust of the eyes and the pride of life? You know, all those things, it fall under from being independence from God, being away from God. And Satan wanted them to be away from God. And when we want to satisfy our loss of the flesh, our loss of the eyes, and the pride of life, we are going away from the house of God. We are going away from the presence of God. When we clamor or when we desire for all these things, we are actually distancing away from God. Because we want those things in our hearts and we want God away from us. And therefore we fall again under the uh, greed, being idolaters. Okay. Now, these things, okay, loss of the flesh, loss of the eyes, and pride of life does not belong inside the house of God. Those things, the three, they do not belong to the heart of a true servant of God. And these sins come from where? From, it says, from the world. In the world and of the world. So when we follow the sins, we go out from God and we go into the world. When you go out, it means you, have, you don't want anything to do with God. When you go out, you leave God behind and you go into the world. Again, we have said that being independent, being away from God, having nothing to do with God will lead us to our failure. Now, this independence, freedom from God, we see that when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, the essence of being independent from God, we have seen that when, when Satan tempted, was tempting Jesus Christ, and that's what Satan wants to achieve. Remember, in the temptation, the, the very essence of the, of the temptation of God is Satan wants Jesus Christ 
to be totally away from the Father. Satan wants Jesus Christ to put his trust to him, to Satan. When you go back to the temptation, that is the essence of the temptation, one of the essence of the temptation of the devil. He wanted Jesus Christ to be totally independent from God. But Jesus, but Jesus Christ, he, he didn't budge. Jesus Christ said no. And Jesus Christ, because of his uh, knowledge of the scriptures, he quoted the scriptures. And by quoting the scriptures, he was totally being dependent from God. But the Satan wants him to be independent from God. But again, Jesus didn't give in to the temptation of Satan. Now, in Luke chapter 15, 14 to 16, and he began to be in need, the younger son. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his belly with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him a thing. So what happened to them? What happened to the younger son? What happened to Adam and Eve when they chose freedom, when they chose independence away from God? They all suffered. And look at what happened to the younger son. When he chose to be away from his father, when he chose his own freedom, this younger son suffered. He began to be in need. And then he hired himself out. He was sent to feed the pigs. And then he ate with the pods the pigs were eating. And no one would give him a thing. In the parable of the prodigal son, the, the father was depicted as a, as, as a good and a loving father. You know, an ideal father that a child would love to have. Okay. And just like our Heavenly Father, who is a good and a loving Father, who lavishes us with everything that we need for in this life and in our spiritual life. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20 tells us, forever, forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his external, eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. God had given us everything. He is a good and loving heavenly father. Now the creations of this world, if you would see the creation, if you would look around you, the order of everything, it demands a divine being, correct? And Romans chapter 1 verse 20 tells us that. And that was, that's why Paul said that we have no excuse for not knowing God. The son, the younger son, though his father was a good man, a loving father, he did not see that qualities of his father. What he saw was his greed. What he saw was his freedom. That's why he wanted out from his father. He did not see the characteristic of his father being good and loving. Well, same with us. We don't see, many people don't see these characteristics of our heavenly father being good and a loving father. But Apostle Paul clearly tells us that everything, the creation, will tell you that there is indeed God and that anybody or nobody can have an excuse of not knowing God. But, but, despite of what is clearly seen, when you look around you, that we have a good and a loving Heavenly Father, we turn a blind eye. We turn a blind eye. Now look at what the following verse reveals to us in verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. 
or give thanks. But they became futile in their reasonings and their senseless hearts were darkened. Now look at what it says. For even though they knew God, people knew God. We knew God. People knew that there is God. But it is just hard for us to see God. We don't want to see God. Look around you. Apostle Paul is telling us, you can see in his creation a good and a loving heavenly father. Probably because it is because God is invisible. That's why people are having a hard time figuring out if there's really God because he is invisible and his presence is not being felt the way it was in the Old Testament, in, you know, when, when God directly talked to them. So that's why probably I was thinking the people today are having this hard time of believing in God because they're not seeing God. But Apostle Paul is clear and the Bible is clear that everything that you see, the creation of this world, the order of everything points to us that there is a divine being who created everything. Remember that life cannot come from a non-life. Remember that. So that's why there is a divine being higher and greater than us that created this world. So just like the sun, he turned a blind eye not to see the goodness of his father, not to see how loving his father was. And when we distance ourselves from God and we seek our own independence from God rather than being dependent upon Him, you know what? There really is no love for us. There really is no love from us for God. When we walk away from God, it means that we don't value God. Independence from God is letting go of the hold of God, letting go of his hands, letting go of the grip of God on you. You know, I always say that we cannot hold God in one hand and hold Satan in the other hand. We cannot do that. We cannot just do that. That won't work. God won't have it. He is a jealous God. It's either you serve him or you don't. It's either you love him or you don't. It's either, it's either you're with him or you're not. You cannot hold God and hold the devil in the other hand. That won't work with God. Okay? We cannot play, you know, master to the real master. We cannot do that. As we reject the hands of God, we are rejecting his, be, his, his deity. We are rejecting his sovereignty. And as we reject this, his sovereignty, it means that you are rejecting his authority over you. When we talk about his sovereignty, we refer to that God created everything. And when you reject God, you are telling God, you did not create me. When you reject God, you are telling him, I am able even if you are not with me. I am sufficient on my own. Remember the last time I stood before you, we talk about the sufficiency of God. Okay. Now, with the futility of our mind, with that kind of attitude that we don't need God, then why would you really honor God who didn't create you? Okay. Why would you thank God for you believe that what you have comes from you? Or why would you thank God for you believe he has nothing to do with your success? For why would you honor God when you believe that he's not the creator of everything? And why do you need God for you believe he has nothing to do with you? If you truly believe that there is no God. And then Paul said, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Because in the first, in the first place, you don't believe in God. Why would you thank God? And why would you honor God. That's why in Romans 1, 28, uh, seven verse, verses after, Paul said, 
since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God. Because they don't want to honor God. They don't want to do anything with God. They don't believe in God. They, don't want, they want total freedom from God. Paul said they thought it foolish to acknowledge God. Indeed, why would you thank God if you don't believe in God? You know, it's quite ironic that people who don't believe in God, when they hit rock bottom, when they are in their misery, they call upon God. Ironic, isn't it? You didn't believe in God, but when you, are, when, when you are down there so low, you are now calling upon God whom you don't believe. That's why Paul said they thought it foolish to acknowledge God. He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and to let them do things that should never be done. Now, what happens is God, that God did not push himself to us. He didn't push himself to us. Okay? But it says he abandoned us to our foolish thinking and let us do things that we should never have done. So God allowed our free will to take its course. If you want to serve me, go ahead. If you don't want, go ahead. God allowed that free will of ours to take its course. But of course, whatever decisions that we would make, there is always a consequence. Good or bad consequence. Now, unfortunately, when we choose to be away from God, when we choose to be independent from God, it will lead to our failure, just like the son in the story. It will lead to your failure, if not in this life, I guarantee you, it will be in the afterlife. And that is for sure. See? So independence from God would lead us to failure. Next lesson would be, as in water face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. Proverbs 27, verse 19. When you look at the pond, you would see the reflection of your face. And the Bible tells us, so a man's heart reveals the man. So when the younger son left his father's house, it was actually confirmatory. Confirmatory action of what really is boiling inside his heart for so long. He really wanted to be away from his father. His decision was not probably, you know, he did it just last night. No. It was boiling, as I've said, in his heart for quite some time that he wanted to leave the father. Now, what was the action of the son? The action of the son was he left his father's house despite the goodness of his father. Number two, he went to a distant country. He lived on his own. Okay? And then third, he squandered everything. That was the action of the son despite the goodness of uh, his father to him. And when the son squandered everything, that is where the meaning prodigal comes in. The word prodigal means wastefully or recklessly extravagant, wasting large amounts of money irresponsibly. The Bible tells us, as the water reflects the face, so a man's heart reveals the man. When the action of this son, we can clearly see the heart of this younger son. We can see that his heart was bent on doing what his own, uh, doing his own desires and doing away with his father. His heart was bent on sins. Clearly, his heart was focused on the three things: lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he ventured into those three things. Now, when he went out, got his inheritance, it was all about himself. Nothing to do with his father whatsoever. All about himself. Unfortunately, many of us are just living for ourselves like this son. We are only trying to live our day 
every day for ourselves, for our family, and not with God. And the Bible is clear that we have to prioritize the Lord. Whatever it takes, we have to prioritize the Lord. Just like this son, we are not living for God. When Jesus Christ opened up his ministry in the book of, uh, the book of Matthew, especially in, in chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, when he opened up, interestingly, his, his lesson was about how to live our lives. There was a contrast, a contrast between living our lives worldly, the worldly viewpoint, and living our lives his way, the Christian view, uh, viewpoint. So when he opened up his ministry, he was telling his audience to live a life that is according to their principle, to God's principle. To a worldly man, it is about himself, me, myself, and I. But to a true servant of the Lord, it is about you. It is about first serving God and then next yourself. It is not the other way around. But again, to a worldly man, just like this younger son, it was all about himself. Now, if you go around and you ask people if they have Jesus, what do you think their answer be? I have asked around in my, my entire life. I have asked around if they have Jesus. And the answer is a resounding yes. Many people that I've asked, they said that, yes, I have Jesus. Yes, they have Jesus. But if you look carefully at the way they live, it's contrary to what they are saying. How could you have Jesus and when you are gambling? How can you have Jesus when your mouth is so dirty? You see, many people will say, well, I have Jesus in my life. But look at their life carefully. It tells otherwise. Now, Titus was right. In Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they profess to know God, but in works, what? They deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. You see, that's why in the middle of the, uh, of the Sermon of the Mount, the Sermon of Jesus Christ, in the middle of it, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, for where the treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, our actions will clearly manifest what is inside our hearts. Your actions will clearly manifest what is the priorities in your life. Even if you say, I love Jesus. Even if you say, I, uh, I have Jesus. I'm living for Jesus. But look at your actions. If your actions say otherwise, then you are not a true servant of the Lord. Okay. You are only fooling yourself by thinking that you are approved by God when in fact you are not because your actions deny God. And many people believe that they are approved by God, but when they look at their actions very carefully, they deny God. Next lesson. In prosperity, you may count on many friends. If the sky becomes overcast, you will be alone. This is a harsh reality. Now, the man in the parable okay, learned it the hard way. You know the meaning of this? When you are wealthy, you have many friends. But when you hit rock bottom, you will be alone. And this man learned it the hard way. He longed to fill his belly with the pots the pigs were eating, but no one would give him a thing. You know, we can only imagine how the son squandered all his wealth, all his money. How he may have created friends in the process. And uh, I was thinking probably he made other people rich, especially those whom he bought their services and their products. He made them rich because of, he has so many wealth. But as soon as his money disappears, his so-called friends disappears as well. 
Now, one, one article that I've read in BuzzFeed.com, uh, there was one revelation by this young man. They used to have uh, a, a, so, so much wealth. They live in a mansion. But soon after, they became bankrupt. So they move out, they, they live to a tiny house. And uh, according to this person, they ate uh, grape nuts for dinner. And for the first time, he saw cockroaches. And they would open up the light to, to scare the cockroaches away. You know? And I think that was the first time he saw what a cockroach looked like. Okay. And when he went to his friends, so-called friends, because when, 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 when the time that uh, he was uh, having the, the, the life, the good life, he was rubbing elbows with the wealthy and with the famous. But when they became broke, he went to his so-called friends. And guess what? His so-called friends told him, we don't want to see you anymore. We don't want to do anything with you. We are ashamed of you. You put us to shame. And that's what you call friends. You see, and um, Ovid was right. In prosperity, you may count many friends. If the sky becomes overcast, you will be alone. You see, they say that money is relative. Money is relative. Do you believe that? I believe that. They say money is relative, and I said, yes, that's true, because the more money you have, the more relatives you have. <laughs> so money is relative. No, I'm just joking. Now, of course, of course, uh, there are those friends who would stick with you through thick and thin. Of course. I believe that. I believe that. And the Bible tells us in, in, in Proverbs 18 that uh, uh, there is a a friend who sticks closer okay, than a brother. And the younger son, you see, he learned it the hard way. When he had nothing, okay, nobody gave him anything. Now, hopelessness reminds us of our futility and need for God. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. Okay. In 17 and 19, finally, he came to his senses. Okay. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have plenty of food? But here I am starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. See, he had this realization that he needed his father because he was hopeless. Now, we pointed out earlier that when we are living a good life, it is easy for us you know, to forget about God. And that is true. That is true. Now, we, we, let, we, we, we let go of God thinking we don't need Him because we are so successful in our own life. We don't need God. But when we face, when you face suffering that leads you to hopelessness, it reminds us, it reminds you that you are, you are vulnerable after all. Okay. Now, I use the word hopelessness. Okay. Because sometimes when we are suffering and we have the resources to get out of our sufferings and we have our own ability to help us get through our trials, we won't call God because we are capable in ourselves. But when we are hopeless, meaning you cannot do anything anymore, that's when you will call upon God. That's why I use the word, when we, when we are suffering and we are truly hopeless, then we turn 
to God. You see, hopelessness will lead us to God. That to feel hopeless is a humbling experience, but it is a good experience to make us realize that we are not God, and therefore we are not invincible. Now let us listen to what Paul learned in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live to it. They thought they would die. But look at what, what he said in verse 9. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learn to rely only on God who raises the dead. You see, when you think you can carry yourself without God, then you don't need God. But when you think you are totally hopeless, just like what Paul said, when you stop relying on yourselves and learn to rely on God, that's the time that you will have the real life. Hopelessness is our fail-safe, I would say, to steer us back to God. It is our autopilot when we are hopeless, when we are in dire needs. It leads us back to God. It is good to experience hopelessness. It reminds us to rely not on our strength, not on our wisdom, not on our ability, but to rely on God alone. And he said to them, watch out, God yourselves against every form of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. See? Greed. Because of greed, we don't want to do anything about God. Because of greed, we think that we can do anything away from God. But God will teach us a way so that we can go back to him. And Luke tells us, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession. What you have comes from God. What you have will not define you. When you look at yourself, when you look at your bank account, when you look at how wealthy we are, those things will not define you. What defines you is what is in your heart. Well, it will define you being ungodly. But true definition of life is when you have God in your heart. One final thought in Luke chapter 9, verse 24. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will saving. Just like the younger son, he wanted to have his life, but in the end, he learned that he will lose his life away from his father. It is a reminder for us that away from God, if we want to save and have our life away from God, we will lose our life. You will definitely fail. But with God, we can have the real life, if not in this earth, in the afterlife in heaven. My dear brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. Let us learn from this younger son. And for those who have not yet accepted the Lord, may, may we um, ask you to open your heart, your heart to God and repent of your sin and come to Jesus Christ and be baptized into his name for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can find your life, your real life hidden with God.